All right. Uh, this is the uh, era of new teaching models. Uh, good. Uh, you want to read off the? Uh, sure. Uh, just to start with our description of our panel for today. In an age when so many people have purchased their own equipment and software and are accessing tutorials available online, our center is making efforts to restructure and redefine the ways they provide instruction. What, producers, what are producers looking for these days when it comes to media production and post-production skills? Have centers exper experimented with a genius bar model or tried to push one-on-one -on -one tutoring for whatever equipment and software the producers may own? Are they moving away from brick-and-mortar classes altogether? Are we moving towards on-site workshops at community sites with computer labs? Are centers emphasizing the social slash community aspects of workshops and post-workshops to provide what folks are looking for? What's getting traction? Okay. Uh, so why don't we go around the room real quickly and just see what everybody here is uh, hoping to get out of this. Uh, 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 I'm Tark. Uh, Juan Cerner, Create TV. Uh, I work with uh, an access facilitator but also a producer there, so um, I know a bunch of uh, projects, but also uh, work with the math students. Uh, so I go out there and actually train uh, elementary, middle school, and high school students on how to use uh, digital equipment uh, so that they can produce video and show us for us. So I just would, I just kind of want to see what you guys are doing and so I can implement some interesting things. Great. My name is Mario Romo. I'm, I'm with the uh, uh, Oxymoron Peninsula. Um, uh, part of my work there involves uh, managing equipment and learning new equipment and software and then training people, uh, you know, members of the community for, from all ages and uh, technical experience kind of thing. And I train to use equipment and produce shows and so on. Hoping to see what you guys have and uh, what's new and what's uh, trends on you know, training people. I'm Hal Taylor. I'm, I, uh, teach at the high schools locally and uh, we've some uh, we've got a department in there for it's, it's for uh, teaching video production. So we'll see the teaching also that. Okay. So um, I'm Diane and I'm the studio manager at Davis Media Access and um, my main role there is to train people. And um, we've been talking about we do um, project-based learning, and um, it's been really successful, but uh, we've been talking about maybe going back to workshops, which we've done in the past, and then when I came on board, that was about the time they were not doing, stopped doing workshops, so just kind of want to see what else there is out there. How are you defining a workshop? Um, well, I'm curious to know how you'll define it, but what they did prior to um, my arrival was to, I believe, you know, you pay a certain uh, fee, very modest, and um, then you might, they would talk about, um, go through sort of basic producing, and then the equipment, um, how you use it in the studio set. There were different workshops, so there was some for field, and some for editing, and some for studio. And so they, and I never actually saw them do them, but they would have a group sit around in the studio, and I guess show them the equipment, talk about how it's used, but I don't, there was no hands-on, um, okay. you know, and, and then when I came on board, it became hands-on, so. Glad to hear that. Yeah. Well, that was a while ago. So it's been five years. Okay. So, I mean, we made this transition to hands-on learning five years ago for studio stuff, and um, which is what I do. But um, just been, I keep hearing things floating around about maybe we need to do other things. <coughs> so. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the two of you, I guess, uh, we're just going around seeing who people are and what they're looking to get for or get out of this class. So, hi, I'm Ralph Brady. I'm at Metro's Community Media, which is in the suburbs, um, east of Portland, Oregon. Um, and we serve four communities out there in the county. Uh, and I'm just always, well, actually, I'm just here to make my trainers like hell. Um, oh. that's, you know, but they, they do a pretty good job on their own of that. I, we have the 
best success in terms of kind of training, education, whatever you want to call it, with young people? And we, that happens because we know how to just put technology in their hands and say, go. And they inevitably get excited and then want to learn more. And we keep trying to transfer <coughs> that model to other situations and, and just get people excited so they want to learn more rather than just kind of teaching them right off the bat. So yeah, I'm, just, I'm looking for different models. I'm looking to pull things up. Yeah. Yes. All right. I'm Sally Rain, and been a classroom teacher. Used to be in the classroom for a long time, and I then moved on to the media center in Palo Alto. I teach the studio production end of the spectrum, all the different pieces and parts. We're going to be going to HD and probably some more consolidated switcher thing, and how to get people to understand that and not quail at doing some of my talk together. I also teach a lot of novice adults how to do camera work and I edit that for them. Um, and teach kids to I mean, I teach lots of stuff, so I'm interested in different ideas for teaching. Excellent. All right, well, uh, shall we introduce ourselves? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, my name's Al Williams, and I'm director of Northampton Community Television in Massachusetts. Yay, that's cool. So I'm from a little bit far away. So you're not doing the East Coast? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the East Coast representative today. Uh, I'm a former National ACM board member, currently I'm the regional board for Northeast. Here visiting for some in West Coast. Uh, Excellent. Uh, my name is Mark uh, Taylor. I work for KMVT in Mountain View. I'm engineer. I teach a couple of the classes. Uh, I've worked with uh, some of the adult education groups in the area as well. Uh, mostly I teach uh, field production, Photoshop, Illustrator, well, not Illustrator, um, After Effects, uh, a lot of software more. Uh, but I also do a lot of uh, functional uh, stuff, such as the field production, and I try and teach uh, photography as well. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get into some case studies about the individual classes, but uh, we'll move on from there. Uh, do you want to start and just talk about? Sure, I can talk a little bit about what we used to do and what we do now, um, and sort of the philosophy and approach we have to training in general. Um, we used to have a format, and there's some discussion over once a workshop, once a class, where we taught a six-week um, intensive uh, class, six, sometimes an eight-week class, uh, also sp usually split along studio or field production lines. We had a lot of problems with that, uh, people missing classes, trying to make those classes up, and also um, mixing hands-on with, um, with the theoretical or here's the spot sort of approach to, to doing things. We really um, have shifted in, in those years to an a la carte approach, uh, where we'll do two hour workshop sessions for people. Um, and there's not a lot of information you can teach in two hours. Just to give you an idea of what our class of lineup is, it's um, probably similar to a lot of you in the room. We do um, a class we call uh, Fundamentals of Cinematography, which is kind of just uh, creating fluency and language around the material. We do a DSLR course. Almost all of our content is shot at, at, on DSLR cameras. Um, we do a lighting course, an audio course, we have editing um, on Adobe Premiere, uh, we have After Effects course, and we also do a series of journals, which I'll talk about a little bit later. <coughs> um, and that's multimedia. So uh, this is a starting point. People can take these classes in any order, and our philosophy really is to orient people to the idea of what we're talking about. Uh, most people, maybe your experience, but from, from our experience when we did larger workshop settings, a lot of people don't return after taking those classes or don't produce content in the day. So this is the case for project-based learning. Um, we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one trainings after the fact and a lot of hand-holding in terms of our education program. So what we're looking to identify in people, and, and this can vary, but generally, we're looking at what kind of result people are trying to achieve. And by looking at that result that they're trying to achieve, if we have three or four people who come to us and are interested in doing a particular production, we'll tailor a workshop to those people and schedule it around that time. So we're really trying to, we build efficiencies in training 
by making sure that the information we're providing is relevant to what people are trying to accomplish. Um, it's a very flexible model, it's a very loose model. Um, we leverage a lot of online tools, and I know that uh, Mark's going to talk a little bit about some of those online tools, and we use a lot of those similar ones. So, so there is a lot of information people can acquire on their own. We want to bring people in the space and give them the hands-on, very specific situational-based learning that, that they're looking for. Um, so it's very, very pragmatic, um, our, our general philosophy of training. Um, we'll create new classes for people based upon interests. Um, or point them to online tools like Linda that, that we'll be talking about. Is anyone, everyone familiar with Linda.com? L-Y-N-D-A. This is Linda.com. You can get a subscription to Linda. If you if you can imagine a piece of software, it probably has some training on here. They update it monthly. It's a variety of, uh, of, of classes. And it, it's really a fascinating structure. One of the strong points in it is that um, the 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 video tutorials are broken down into a couple minute segments and they're surgical. So if you're looking for something very specific in After Effects that you want to figure out how to do, you can go on Linda and there's probably a five minute tutorial on there as to how to accomplish that. Okay? There are education, you can buy educational seats for this as well. So you can buy multiple seats for whatever center or organization you're running. They have packages built around that. And um, you know, this kind of training isn't for everyone. There's no one turnkey training solution that's gonna to apply to everyone that you need that comes through your door. So we're trying to identify the broadest ways of training people and then also accommodate people who are people who are more theoretical learners or hands-on learners. Okay, it's a very, very adaptive approach that we take. Um, a note about our citizen journalism project, and, and I don't want to monopolize the time here, but but one thing that our citizen journalism program does is it breaks down all the elements of multimedia production into units that include writing, planning, uh, scheduling, photography, uh, using the back end of a WordPress site, which is what we use for our citizen journalism program. It's called Paradise City Press. Um, you can actually print that out more. It's paradisecitypress.org. So, um, one thing to think about not only how you're training, is what you're training. We've quadrupled our internship program by creating a citizen journalism program because, because it brings people through the door who don't traditionally self-identify themselves as videographers or filmmakers, but they have an interest in expression. All of that? It's called Paradise City. No, 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 what you say? You... We're, we're bringing, we're attracting people, previously when we were doing multimedia internships or production internships, most of the people who identify with that kind of work either have a background or an interest in audio production or video production. They have cameras, or they, they're interested in music, and they're, they have a background with bands, etc. cetera. Um, what this brings into the fold are writers, okay? people who maybe want to learn a visual skill, but don't currently self-identify with that skill. So we try to create opportunities to bring people into the organization. That's the goal. Once people are in the door and they're participating, they may try something else that we're doing. But if you don't get people through the door and you aren't engaging them in some, some kind of learning that you're providing, then you've lost them already. Okay, so we're, we're continuing to try to broaden our concept of both what our mission is and what kind of offerings we can provide. Um, along similar lines, we're partnering with uh, maker communities in our area. Is everyone, is everyone familiar with maker spaces or the maker community? So this is a group that um, is uh, it's hard to describe the maker community, I guess. They, uh, <laughs> they make things, right. And I guess one way of differentiating, one way the maker community differentiates itself from the traditional creative arts community is that it doesn't use the term artist. Because similarly, the term artist can be off-putting to some people. So uh, the idea of maker is it's very inclusive as a term. And so you see a lot of people, there's a lot of robotics creation in maker spaces, or carpentry, or circuit bending, things like that, lock picking. That's an interesting thing about the maker community. So um, we're partnering with the maker community to bring those people through the door because they're creators and they're self-motivated creators. So we want to utilize our space to offer classes and use, use our physical space, which is one of our important resources um, that differentiates ourselves from online learning tools and bring those people in the door similarly to hope that they may find, spark some interest in what it is that we're doing at our, at our station. So, so this uh, citizen project yeah. is based towards writers. 
it's it's an online it's an online newspaper, online oh. hyper local newspaper right. essentially. Okay. Though we also we also um, describe it not only as citizen journalism but also as community storytelling. Again, with the idea that the term journalist can be off putting to some people who want to write or blog or create opinion pieces, but don't cons don't identify themselves as journalists. Um, when we do when we provide citizen journalism workshops, we have a professional journalist come in that we hire to teach teach the, the writing portion of that. We also actually have a theater teacher come in who teaches storytelling. Um, one of the things we've noticed historically is that you can, you know, and this goes back to sort of the button, push, the button pushing multi-week workshop where you show everyone where all, what all these things do. And then they're completely lost. They have no idea where to start. Okay, it's very intimidating. This is, it's not easy to create. Um, so we try to bring, we try to also address that side of things by bringing in someone who knows what a beginning, middle, and end is. Um, we're really focused on short pieces. That's another thing the Citizen Journalism Program allows us to do is if you're gonna make your first mistakes and your second and your 10th and your 100th and your 500th, do it in a short piece because you've invested less time, right? Do they ever take these pieces and roll them into video? Oh yeah, so it's so it's still so there's it can be anything on that on that aspect that we do of what we do. We encourage you, they're creating video most people, but they start with stills. Everything has to have a written component. Oh. Sometimes people use just or it's actually not everything has to have a written component. Sometimes people are just doing audio recording, so like podcasting, and we'll host that on the site as well. Um, we're essentially, we think of our, generally, if we have tools, we want them to be used. And if they're not being used, we feel like we're not doing our job as well as we hope to do, ultimately, in any, whatever kind of creative capacity that is. Um, that's, no, 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 no. Uh, one other thing I would say we do with high school students, I know some of you are teaching, identifying high school students, as a way of really breaking through um, that paralysis that you have after after that initial exposure to um, to the tool set, is we have people recreate content that already existed. In so a famous scene from a film, putting that together helps um, helps understand the execution of those tools. We find that a really good model to to engage. You when you are put together. One fee pays all, or is it you pay for a course, or we have, and we we do not charge for workshops. We we in fact our model was, and this is shifting slightly, but we uh, we have an annual fee. Our station is based on an annual membership fee, but that is also a recommended donation. It's waivable upon anyone's request, and we don't ask questions why people are asking for waivers. One, because we're not trying to um, create any barriers to entry. The reason that, you, one of the reasons you set these, or the two reasons you set these, one is because you're trying to raise revenue. That's not as much of a problem in Massachusetts as it might be on the West Coast. Um, we have really strong funding models. Um, the other reason is that you want buy-in from people so they show up to the classroom and attend, right? But we found generally that it doesn't, either way we do it, we're, you know, people are showing up or not showing up. And so we, the and the amount of money we raise through that is not significant compared to our our global budget. So um, we don't like to uh, we we encourage people to donate. Actually, people donate a lot more easily. This is a slightly different topic, but people donate a lot more easily when you tell them they don't have to do. Yeah. So people will just write us checks sometimes and say, oh, "You guys are doing a great job." It's also a little bit odd to have people who are active in the organization and volunteering on work then struggle with paying you money to do that. And they're already contributing to what it is you're building, which is this community. Mm -hmm. So that's our current solution. And what about, uh, you, I mean, you guys go rent out cameras and stuff. Is that also uh, a major rate? In terms of rental or checkout? So yeah, those, checkout. So checkouts are free. Uh, oh. We do do rentals. So like you have a pro side also. We have a pro side too. So we are a rental service for local professionals. We do do that. We have a chip. And the DSLRs are here to rent it out because we're about an hour and a half from Boston, which is the nearest place you can rent some other higher 
So I'm not here. However, if it's, if it's, uh, it's just part of that industry. As long as you're creating content that's non-commercial and that we can distribute, then it's right. Excuse me, I, I don't mean to sign off. I came, I came here, uh, yeah. wait, what's the name of this workshop? This is the uh, era of new teaching models. Oh, cool. Alright. Once again, it's the other one, but their doors locked, so this will work with me. Perfect. Yeah, they're kind of exclusive over there. They don't like uh, everybody. Yeah, we're exclusive. We want to train everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I teach over I teach at Access. I access at the mouth, so I, you yeah, know, this helps. Great. Uh, maybe the last thing I just mentioned, oh, uh, and Barry had a question, but uh, just that we do a lot of staff assistance too. So when we have people come through our training program, so we'll take a staff, if you have an idea for a shoot, we'll loan you a staff member to come out and help you with that first shoot. Um, because again, that intimidation factor, that's what we're trying, trying to really accomplish. It's definitely a lot more challenging, I know, for the people who are, that, who you are teaching high school courses where you may have 20, 30 people in a class, it's a whole bit animal. No, that actually was going to be my question. Um, do you do all your teaching at your station, or when you mentioned youth and high school kids, do you actually teach at a high school? We're located inside the same building as a high school, so the answer is kind of yes, but that's that's an answer of convenience. We have done workshopping outside of our space um, at the local library, um, at a senior center. So we do, we are interested in that. That's actually a model we're looking to push out more into. Um, to create satellite locations where we can have training. Hopefully have other nonprofits become trainers for us. And because some of these online training tools that, that Mark is gonna reference are, are so widely available, a lot of that, a lot of those training people can get on their own. And of course, it varies depending upon who you're talking about, whether that person is has internet access and how comfortable that kind of access is to them, so. All right, great. Uh, so, sorry, so now that you, so with that, that model of uh, donations, how, how busy is that pretty, pretty bad with that? We're, we're very busy. Yeah, we have, we, we're, to give you an idea for checkouts, camera checkouts, we have um, four checkout, 10 DSLRs and two JVC HM150s and almost every week at all. And how big is your uh, viewer base or your community base? So our community is uh, 10,000 households, 10,000 subscriber households, 28,000 population. That's very impressive for you, the uh, population. We, yeah. it's, a, it's a pretty, it's an arts community, and it's a, it's a sort of, it's a somewhat, I guess, politically progressive arts community with a lot of do-it-yourselfers. We have, um, we've also brought people, I, I'd also just mention, um, I tend to harp on the DSLR aspect of what we do, but, but having the kind of equipment you have is also reflecting through your education program because um, the number of young people we had come through our door changed dramatically once we started supporting DSLR camera technology because a lot of those people are like, if, they, if they're, they're not that, DSLRs are relatively inexpensive compared to the kinds of cameras even the most access them. And they're a little bit trickier to use because yeah, you usually have to record audio separately, and so it's a little intimidating. And they're they're not as much they're not as automatically functional. Um, yeah, uh, Lucas, can you hold that up? So right there, you go. Right, exactly. So, um, but they're 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 sure pretty, right? And, and it's a huge huge difference. And when you're offering that kind of technology to people, they're a lot more interested in participating at your center and your whole image changes about who you are. It's also true about bringing like local, we have local professionals who are freelancers who now do work with us for free to do community programming just because they have a different perception of what it is or about of, of, of our image. We, you know, we have, we have some GoPro, Euro 3, and things like that, point of view cameras. We try to buy a lot of fun toys. Really, that's, we want to be fun and cool. That's part of a good education program is making people like want to be there and targeting their interests. It's really, it's part of that results. There you go, perfect. We did a whole, uh, we had our annual meeting and we tied one to Hulu. And we have all this footage of, oh, <laughs> yeah, have you seen those videos? So it's just, you, see, you can watch the person who Hulu from the perspective of Hulu. It's really easy to do, and it's fun. Uh, we've had a number of people come in since we started, so won't we reintroduce ourselves? Sure, I'm Al Williams, I'm the director of Northampton Community Television in Northampton, Massachusetts. 
My name is Mark Taylor. I'm from KMVT uh, in Silicon Valley, Mountain View, uh, pretty close to here. Uh, all right, well, we'll move on to uh, what our station is doing. Uh, we are sort of in the midst of redesigning our classes. Our staff is already pretty much at limit. So a number of our specialty classes, we are bringing in additional people to specifically teach those classes. Uh, just to go through what our station has, uh, we've uh, developed a couple of different things. We have our uh, regular classes or workshops, and then we have uh, youth activities. Uh, and we've developed both of them separately so that we can actually specialize in each category. Uh, I'll just quickly go through uh, some of the classes. So like everybody, we got our studio production and we've got a field production. Uh, we've got producer training, directors, audio, remote truck production, uh, editing, after effects, uh, uh, photography. Uh, here's one that you might want to look at. Uh, social media, social good, and your nonprofit. We hold these uh, up to three times a year, and they usually get pretty good uh, attendance. We have uh, an expert in social media come in along with our executive director, Shelley, uh, and they will talk on the subject of Facebook, Google+, Twitter, and uh, blogging, and all of those related uh, categories uh, to a group of uh, professionals or other nonprofit leaders. So within our community, we've got other nonprofits, uh, we've got businesses that are trying to improve their own uh, social media uh, attention. And so all of those people can come in and learn at that workshop. So we're not focusing strictly on the video production side of things, which uh, sometimes people will sort of get focused on, we're a TV station, so we're going to do studio production, field production, editing. Uh, don't forget that the community you're serving is also going to be interested in a lot of this other stuff. And as this stuff evolves, it's going to become a larger and larger part of your station. And so you're going to have to train your staff as well. So uh, if you guys can keep up with that now, it's going to be, be a lot easier later. Uh, going over to the uh, youth activities, we do summer camps for you. Uh, there we go. So we do youth tours, after school programs, and camps. So we've got uh, after school programs where after school, these cameras back here, XA10, uh, Canon XA10, uh, we've sent a bunch of those out to the schools with a couple of our educators. And they uh, have a class of up to uh, 10 junior high students. Uh, producing content. They'll cover sporting events or uh, uh, school meetings the, uh, where they grab everybody throw them into the uh, gymnasium or whatever. Uh, or any other events that might be happening. Uh, plays or performances. And it's uh, the kids seem to have a great time. Uh, Renee's probably somebody you'll want to talk to afterwards. He covers some of that. And it's a pretty easy way to uh, include the schools. One of the things that we're trying to do with these classes is we're engaging the youth. What we're doing there is we're sort of priming them for jumping in and becoming um, crew and producers at our station as they get older. Because one of the things we've had trouble with is getting the younger generations into our station. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, as the station evolved, we weren't advertising to the youth as well. So our entire uh, crew and producers, they time marches on and uh, we didn't pull in more people. So that's one of the things we're looking to do now is trying to uh, advertise to the youth. DSLRs and uh, GoPros are great ways to target youth. Uh, media, uh, mobile media devices, uh, so cell phones, tablets, additional ways to uh, target them. So classes uh, with those as subjects. Uh, specifically, one of the things that 
we haven't rolled out yet, well, partially we've rolled out, is online learning. So if a person is going to learn from your station, we want it to be a, a staged uh, basis. So you go to our website and you're going to come up with tips. Uh, for the most part, we've just got how-to guides on how to run things at our station at the moment. But we're progressing towards creating a social media environment as well as a blog and other uh, areas where if you have trouble uh, creating your video content, you come to our website, you want to see some ideas, you want to uh, think about how you're going to create a new intro for your uh, show. Uh, there's some uh, good guides on our website, some tips, some uh, inspiration. You then have online tutorials, something like lynda.com or uh, Scott Kelby. Uh, Scott Kelby is a photographer who has online training uh, videos. Uh, you actually can watch a selected video free uh, they change it out each week, so each week you can uh, watch one free video. This week it's uh, freeze motion photography. So that has to do with using flashes to freeze motion rather than fast shutter speeds. Uh, this all helps to uh, generate interest in your station. So, and it also provides a way for you to give homework to people when you have multi-day classes. So when you've got your field production or your studio production class that goes for a month, you can say, all right, well, we've just covered how to operate a camera. I'm going, here's a bunch of links to some videos on our website. Here's a couple more links to uh, some other sites. I want you to go home, watch a couple of videos. These are inspirational videos, uh, how to do it. These. This is uh, what you can accomplish. It also, uh, don't be afraid to keep a, a TV in your uh, classroom or your studio for showing back uh, uh, completed pieces of work. So when you're telling somebody uh, to pan left or track or truck right, you can actually uh, hook the uh, camera into the, uh, TV and you can they can actually see what the director is telling them so it's not simply a matter of saying I want you to pan left so you're going to turn the camera this way I want them to actually see what the director is uh, showing now take that over to After Effects or to Premiere for editing and you're talking about setting up a computer putting it on a projector or something so that they can see it and uh, doing interactive stuff. Uh, with my After Effects class, I have several projects that uh, I hand out that uh, talk about different ways that you can create motion in After Effects. And they get to play with each of those projects to see how I created those effects. And they're very visual. I have uh, little poker chips that move across the screen to show how you can get things to speed up and slow down and what the differences are. By having that being very visual, uh, it makes it a lot easier for people to understand exactly what we're talking about. So keep the visuals there, uh, and by having uh, a lineup of videos online that you can refer people to for extra credit or for additional learning, people don't just stop learning at the end of the two hours because the two hour class or the three hour class, there really is very little time to uh, cover that. I barely get through uh, some of our camera and lighting gear when I'm talking about equipment at our studio. Uh, and if I then can forward them to completed pieces of work from other producers that have used the equipment or to additional uh, video guides as to how to achieve a specific look or how to uh, benefit yourself when you're dealing with a skylight or something. Uh, those can be great references for people to, one, continue to be involved in your station. So they're watching your videos, giving you more views. They are uh, staying involved with your website. 
or your community in general. Uh, and that's after they leave the station. So just because they leave the station doesn't mean they shouldn't be involved in your class. Uh, providing uh, material for them to go home with is always a great thing. I usually try and do it digitally, uh, less printing and a little bit easier to uh, get the information out. I can always update it later. Uh, so those are some of the ways that I try and uh, target people to uh, encourage them to keep uh, moving with this. Uh, let's see, what would be uh, so a couple of the areas uh, to look at, Vimeo Video School, uh, they do this really well. It's free, so you can watch it without any payment or anything. Uh, they go through some wonderful uh, basics on how to operate equipment. It doesn't get in, it's not very technical, so it's not going to tell you exactly what the f-stop uh, calculation is for these various things, which is probably good because that would scare most people out of most classes. Uh, but it does explain how to properly expose, uh, what the different modes on a camera are, and uh, that sort of thing. And getting people past the introductory, the introductory classes, and then keeping them in, interested in the thing really should be the focus of the intro classes. If they're just about getting people to know how to do equipment, we can do a really boring technical speech, and they're not going to be inspired at the end of the class. But if you have, and that really defines, I think, the difference between a class and a workshop. A class is um, sort of what we're doing here. We're sitting up here and we're talking to you. A workshop is more about getting people to stand up and or sit down and get on the keyboard and uh, start doing the work themselves in the class. So it's more interactive. At least that's my thought on it. Additionally, if you are doing a traditional class type, even if it is a workshop, where you're taking the camera, pan right, pan left, and all right, next person, take up, pan the camera left, pan the camera right. Yes, you end up knowing pan left, pan right but you don't have anything to really show after you've done it. You don't have that achievement uh, factor that you want people to have. And that's where setting up project-based classes or workshops really begins to help. Uh, so if you look with uh, a lot of the classes, let's see, there we are, Linda. Uh, these go through and uh, They'll very often, well, some of them will, uh, the project-based ones at least, some of them are more based on how to do specific things with a camera. Other ones are uh, how to do some green screen work. And they will run you through a project. And being, it's very helpful to actually have a green screen set up. They walk up, set up the camera. They get to see that exposing the green screen at 70% and the person uh, at this percentage and whatnot really helps to differentiate themselves from the background or why to use the blue screen instead of the green screen because almost everybody just thinks green screen. So uh, yes, and we yes we do a lot of green screen with our kids camps. Uh, they really love that stuff. Uh, and we'll do some weird, or, uh, we create uh, video loops and whatnot, so you get these wavy arm things. They have a lot of fun with that. But we also have uh, a rainbow wig with some green in it. Uh, we have some shirts uh, that, with various green patterns on it. And of course, uh, when we do scout tours for the scout troops in the area, uh, some of their patches are green, and so you'll get holes in the kids as they're up there uh, speaking. So there is a reason for a blue screen, but they also have a lot of fun with those uh, missing uh, body parts if they've got uh, green caps or green pants or green shirts on. So uh, that's mostly what I wanted to just go over is just going towards uh, the project-based uh, 
classes, and then you want to have content that you include with the class that people can continue to use after uh, they've completed the actual workshop. Uh, one of the things that you're going to see a lot in the professional world is master classes. And that's really just a fancy way of saying a workshop with a well-known professional. Uh, they charge quite a bit of money for some of these. Uh, I've seen them up to about five to ten thousand dollars, and you might get a couple of days with the guy. And there's eight other people you're sharing your time with. They're making a lot of money. <laughs> you're uh, learning a bit, but uh, it really helps to start out with uh, some of these classes, and then maybe take one of their classes if you've got the uh, spare cash. But when you do these workshops, a lot of these master classes are also videotaped. So after they videotape the class, all the students get to keep the videotape. And you can then put that on your website and uh, charge people uh, five bucks to watch it. So not only are people you getting the people that showed up to the class, but you're also uh, providing the class to those that uh, could not make it, whether time, distance, or uh, financial responsibilities didn't let them. And of course, financial is dependent upon uh, your class models. Uh, our station does charge for classes, uh, pretty reasonable rates compared to uh, most of the other uh, educational uh, groups in the area, but still, uh, money is tight with a lot of producers. So, providing once you've done the class, you've got the video, let them watch it for uh, pennies on the uh, class. Uh, if it's a class that is required to uh, use a product, uh, just do a, uh, make sure that they can uh, watch it, that they go through a checkout or a uh, testing process or something. But those are all options. All right? How's everybody feeling about that? Uh, so, uh, we didn't get through, well, we got most people's uh, questions, I think, with the first round. Uh, are there any areas of uh, this educational thing that you guys want us to focus on for our remaining time? Yeah. Question. Um, getting people back into the studio after they've gone through the class yeah. and mm -hmm. they know you know, do you have any experience with like mentorship models or requirements after that they have to come back to try it out? Because they do the class and where we are, they create shows, so they have the project, they've done the whole production, and then they don't come back. Question or comment? Actually, a comment. Uh, okay, we have uh, we have uh, two different kinds of classes. We have like our, our studio production class. And we also have our introduction to digital production, which they check out. You know, the, the cameras are assigned to the class for four weeks, and then they come in and use uh, Final Cut Pro X for the remaining for the remaining time. On the studio class, what happens is that when they get, you know, when they complete the work, when they complete the workshop, uh, we send, you know, they're if they're interested, we send them over to our flagship show called LiveWire, which we use as a training ground. They get their, you know, they get their certification. They get their certifications for that, or if they want to try to work on other people's projects, they let the other people know that, hey, I got through with uh, studio certification. If you need me on something, let me know. On um, the final, on the final of that workshop, what we, you know, we do, like you say, you know, like they, they got the footage, they got the footage that they shot in the class, and they had, and we, I give them about, I give them 30 days to hurry up and have it worked on. And and they can move on to something else. And what happens is that we start getting the retention of people coming in to use the equipment a, a lot more. So if there, I think if there's something, you know, if you make something, you create like a project or if you have like a show that you can use as a training ground, then that's how you can help start your retention. Because we, when we're doing live wire, you know, some, some of the um, people that come in through the studio they come in and they uh, work on two shoots and they're certified and then they branch off and they do their own shoots. So that's, you know, that's, uh, 
that's the thing you have to, you have, to uh, have something waiting for them when you get out. Yeah, so having uh, bonuses for when people take classes. So our studio uh, class, after you have completed it, uh, assuming you didn't destroy the camera when you <laughs> get it, uh, you have six months before you need to become a member of our station uh, to start crewing on shows. Uh, what that does is you don't have to be a member of our station to take class. You, you don't have to be a member to take the classes then? No, you don't have to be a member to take the class, but after the class you have six months to become a member uh, or you get like a six month uh, temp membership and then you need to become a member to continue to crew on shows. But it creates a very quick turnaround where people take the class and then we have our eager to crew list. So anytime anybody has completed the class and they get put on this eager to crew list and that's handed out to all of our producers and they are encouraged to call up these people on the eager to crew list and get them to show up at their shows. Uh, it is fairly successful. Uh, I don't know our retention rate, but I believe it, we get at least uh, out of say 30 people that go through the studio production class, I think we retain about six. So uh, not too bad, but I it I think there's well, you'll have to talk to uh, Bobby. He's the one that uh, teaches the class. He knows the exact number. But it does vary quite a bit from uh, class to class. Yeah. Are you sending that via email to your producers, or are you how how are your producers getting the, the list? Well, uh, one, all the uh, crew have the people that want to be on it have to sign up for it because we can't distribute their information. Yeah, no, so the ego crew. So the yeah, you, you, your ego crew list is that mailed or emailed? that is emailed upon request by a producer. It's all. We also have a little cubicle area for producers, and we keep a copy in there. Uh, and that way producers have access to it, but it's not on our website uh, being displayed for everyone. And what's in your studio rates uh, for so? Uh, studio rates are 35 an hour. Uh, and that's with two, two crew or one crew? Uh, we provide one staff member. They don't, uh, they don't usually do camera or direct or anything like that. They're just there to make sure all the equipment keeps running. Uh, our studio, uh, all the productions that are uh, community produced are 100% volunteer. Uh, other than lighting, uh, which a staff member does, but that mostly has to do with insurance and people on ladders and stuff. Uh, but otherwise, uh, our station is almost 100% volunteer, including our uh, sports. So if you guys took a look at our uh, truck out there, uh, whenever we go out, Bobby takes the truck, grabs uh, four, five volunteers, and heads out. So it's almost completely volunteer. You also have non-volunteer shows, or is it all? Oh, we have a handful of staff-produced uh, shows. We also have a staff-produced show model. So if you don't have time or you don't want to get crew, uh, the staff will uh, cover your show. Uh, that is, uh, it's a new thing that we're rolling out. It's been fairly popular with some of, when they get uh, very professional uh, uh, people, uh, Steve Ballmer, Wozniak, that, those sort of people. And at that point, is it a, the staff do show the uh, rates rate? Uh, rate yeah, show it item? is a, a per show uh, thing, depending on what they're looking for. Uh, oh, per show. Yeah, I think we're looking, the starting rate was like 200, 250 or something. Yeah, that's what we're at, 200. And you have staff, and you have two staff for two hours. Yeah. Well, on our model, we had it factored in as a they their membership, mm -hmm. and, their, and the, class, the classes are usually extra, but once they get certified on those classes, they're, as long as their membership is current, the uh, equipment's free to, equipment's free to use. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, as far as our staff goes, we have, you know, we, we do the work of staff, the work of staff goes and, you know, make sure that some, you know, the cameras are running and uh, make sure the cameras are running, make sure everything is ready to go, make sure they, you know, they can do it. We have a couple of shows that we do 
that was that the time where we had like uh, two people, you know, just two people like themselves here trying to do it with the group, and they kept on having issues. So they decided that they were just going to do it themselves. One person acts as a host, the other person controls everything in the control room, and they turn out pretty high quality product. Oh yeah, uh, we've got one or two shows that do something similar. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, especially, and we recently upgraded to the TriCaster uh, mm -hmm. 855, and so we're uh, starting to roll out uh, new classes with uh, streaming media. Uh, we're trying to get a lot of these shows to also now do uh, intro animations with After Effects or something similar. Uh, Pond 5 is a great place to find those things, and so get. Anybody that starts a new show, we're trying to get them to come in. We'll do a template sort of thing, and then we just so that they've got something more than the uh, show uh, name on an uh, alpha back background. So moving a little bit beyond just uh, plain text. Yeah. I got another question, and this you know this is a question. How do you tell them? How do you tell like the producer you know that we got like a nice fancy opening? that, you know, like a nice fancy animation board for their show. How do you tell them to keep the same theme music? Well, uh... I, I, got, I got a show, I got a show, He's, the guy's got a snazzy, the guy's got a snazzy opening, but every time when he, the show comes on, you never can tell what his theme is going to be. So, new theme music every time? Or? Yeah, he, he changes the theme music every, every show. Well, uh, you got a brand, you got a creative brand. That, you yeah. know, I when I was in the when I watch any of the '80s shows, you know, or I still watch TV, I watch it. I know the song, you know what it is. I, I, I like to I keep them trying to, you know, the show, the inside of your show, you can change, but you want to keep your, your well, elements the same. Yeah, right? that's what I'm that's what I'm trying to get. That's what I'm trying to get them. To, that's what we're trying to get them. Show them examples of final last poses, just like you said, and then show. Them. I did, I did. One thing you could probably do is we uh, do a couple of producer meetings every year. Uh, one to two, depending on uh, how much time we've got, they kind of get shifted because of the ACM conference or other events. But we invite every single producer and any crew members that want to come in, talk to the staff. The staff are all there. We take questions. We give answers. And we all usually provide a few uh, tips. And one of you could uh, just say, well, I'm gonna talk to you guys about branding your shows a little bit better. And you can say, uh, come out with some sort of a jingle for your show, because an audio cue is one of the best things you can do to identify a show. To uh, help that, you can grab maybe a few uh, jingles from those 70 shows and uh, play them. and do a game where people try and guess what they are. It's usually a pretty easy thing, depending on which ones you pick, but yeah. Unless he's revolutionary, and it's the, uh, and that's how it's going. Which it was, like, yeah. was, <laughs> this one's not. Yeah, yeah. This one's, yeah, that you should. I was going to ask you a question, it's a uh, very interesting gentleman from Massachusetts. Um, I just didn't know how to articulate, but I wanted to get to that part. How do you found, or how do you who teaches these classes? Because that's one, like the reality in one, you know, like the station work of where I come from, is that we don't have enough staff. Like, you know, each, there's only five of us, and all of us, I manage the equipment, the trainings, I also produce for the, you know, for the station. So we wear a lot of hats. And that's one of the pros. I don't know if you guys have any ideas or any uh, words or advice on, like, producers teaching each other. Or if you guys have, you know, because, like you explained that your community is like this progressive community that is very oriented to the you know the arts. They put, I think that the community that the station lives in and how that community perceives that kind of, you know what we do has a lot of different more so if they have money to you know contribute. Uh, you know you buy the new toys and all that, but the reality is something is that it's different. You know how do you deal with that? So I mean I think a couple ways. One is. All staff teaches. Everyone we have, we have four full-time staff, but everyone teaches, including myself. And um, some people teach. You know, some people are better in certain skill sets than others on staff. Everyone who works at our facility has production jobs. We don't hire anyone who doesn't. And so, um, 
So we split those duties. There, are, there one of our staff members teaches more, more of the courses, has more of the course load than, than others. So, so that happens. There, there are, we have had, we, we hire out sometimes. So we will bring people in to teach classes and give them, pay them a stipend, you know, $100 per, per a session, depending upon what it is. Um, so we will hire out. We also will, um, in internship programs, for instance, we have interns train other interns. Once you, and I think this models well for, for large curriculum or large, large groups as well. If you can have, if you, if you can establish a couple people who are well trained and who are passionate about the work, they can do some mentoring. You can have some people who are volunteers or producers or students or interns who are willing to take on mentoring roles. Yeah, because that's one of the challenges that we face. I, I kind of like started doing this like a couple of years ago, but then I, I encountered that a lot of the producers, they weren't really committed. So, so sometimes we'll have like, you know, three, four people lined up for the class one night, and then like half an hour before the class, the producer will come like, oh, I'm sick, we're having stuff in traffic, I'm not going to make it. Like, oh, and we don't have any staff members to cover the class, you know, so that, that lack of commitment, you know, it goes hand in hand with not getting paid. <laughs> Do you have a lot of, one thing that's also worked for us is, is partnering with nonprofits. So, Boys and Girls Clubs, um, uh, you know, someone from Boys and Girls Club staff, for instance, um, or even school staff, um, there's some alternative learning programs for like disadvantaged youth in our in local communities or um, non-traditional learners, things like that. Well, you know, those people don't always have to be trained in video production, but what they can be trained is keeping people on task a little bit, bring people in, and and you can handle the technical side of it, but they're gonna they're gonna carry the the rest of that way, and and there are that's already a team of people, right? So I think this speaks to sort of efficiencies. If you if you if you're training people who aren't coming back, that's not really that's not an efficient use of your time, right? Or anyone's time, really. Um, I mean, there's something to be said for just the education component, whether they come back or not. But but I think if you can find relationships where some people are helping you carry that load or whatever portion of that load they can carry, that's one way of sort of you know, increasing capacity for what you do. Are you um, are you paying these? members of the nonprofit or are they just using 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 it as part of their thing? They're using it as part of it. It's just a collaborative relationship. And how many people do you have on staff? You said four. Four people. Huh? That's great. I'm a part time teacher, so they hire me to teach the studio production class and when I teach summer camps, there's always at least one high school intern who has gone through the program before, maybe a couple of years, and they are my helper. They like they can teach the camera while I'm teaching the switcher directing. So the more simple roles, the high school students who've done it, they've shown commitment, they volunteer to community service to the that helpers. Helps and that helps yeah. the All youth also. Help. <laughs> yeah, so that's another way to get people more involved. Thank you. I, uh, I got a question, and it's probably gonna be different for different centers based on the, just the population income resources organizations that are available to you but if you had to rebuild your training program from scratch what is going to be the core of your training program for bringing people in because you've got technology completely changed the game so it may not be as relevant to teach this traditional studio cam versus a dslr yes where do you start if you're going to start this I, I would say and i would know we don't even have studio production anymore we multi-cam increase everything in post studio work. Um, it's really weird where we are. Um, but so I would say two things. Well, a couple things. One, low barrier entry, meaning you're meeting the needs of as many people as you can, and that's part of technology. So we also have flip cams that we train people on. So keep the barrier low, but also the potential for quality high. And that way you're just sort of, you're, you're attacking interests from two levels. Um, you can make things that look that empower people in really interesting ways and also be as inclusive as possible. The other thing is really, it's, and you mentioned this in your preface, that because communities, you know, we represent a, probably a wide variety of communities in this room or circumstances and situations. So you really need to identify the needs or the desires of your constituency. So that's, you build by finding out what people want. So I wouldn't conceive of the model and then impose it. I think that's a habit that 
we get into as an industry is that we say this is what we do and this is who we are and then how come no one's showing up instead of saying what are people looking for you know they want to be they want to have they want to have access how do they want to have access and what do they want to have access to what do they want to create who are they and how do we go out and do that and you have to be proactive about it too you might have to go out and find those people or go out and bring your training program to them and it's very custom customized to your community i'd also say be very risk friendly one of the big advantages of small organizations is you can try something completely new or outlandish, and if it's a mistake, you can change it the next month. Be risk friendly. Yeah, it's not, you know, not being a large corporate bureaucracy yeah. is problematic because you don't have the resources. But those kinds of organizations can't move very well. They're very slow to move, and they're they're very legacy, you know, based and entrenched organizations. So don't be that way. You know, play to your strengths. It's up. And uh, back to uh, your question uh, with regards to getting people to help out with the classes. Uh, interns, great way. Uh, volunteers, if you are having trouble with volunteers, offer them a free rental if they help out with three classes. Yeah. Uh, something like that, a rewards program. Uh, we had, when our station went through Divco, we actually got rid of our rewards program, but uh, it's looking like we may be uh, reinstating something similar at least. We also had about uh, half of our producers doing their entire shows on uh, that because everything we were doing uh, earned people uh, credit towards shows, but uh, yeah, and of course, interns, uh, just getting them to cycle through. So youth camps, they start teaching, uh, helping out with that. We've got Several interns, you probably actually saw one or two of them around here. Uh, and then, of course, getting the volunteers to help out. Uh, staff only need to really make sure that everything works. If you can get uh, a, a couple of volunteers who have been with the station a while or just know what they're doing, uh, that's probably one of the easiest ways to uh, get additional staff without paying too much. All right, yes. So the problem that we run into is um, there are two types of people that come in who are interested in this center. Those who are techies and want to learn tech stuff and those who want to produce content. And the two don't cross. Producers want to do content, the techies aren't interested in producing it. And we see it over and over and over again. So typically what happens is the, the the most success we've had actually has been with the techies, and that's sort of what I do. That's part I do because um, I was a broadcast professional for a long time. I have very uh, a lot of network and professional experience. So when I train them, they are really getting it, and um, they get all turned on. And I've sent kids off to you know, film school and. Um, you know, become directors at small stations and work their way up, and, and that's all cool, but it doesn't help us create content. So, um, one of the things we talk about is, okay, once these techies learn stuff, you know, how do we pair them up with the producers? Well, it just, this is kind of where we're at right now, and the producers come in, they have all these great ideas, and then they find out how long it takes to actually do something, and they peter out. And it happens every single time, you know, they're all excited, they're all, you know, and then, you know, if it's the editing, it's an hour of editing for a minute on tape, and then, you know, pretty soon they just get, and some of the most enthusiastic ones, you know, I think this guy's really going to make it through, they don't. And part of it is because we can't staff support all those producers. We are only four and a half, not yet four and a half people, and um, there, and two of them, you know, and Two of them really just don't have any kind of time to do any of that kind of support for the producer. So we've been talking about how are, how do we generate contact? How do we keep them here and with the money? Well, uh, that goes to uh, the eager to crew list. Uh, by keeping a list of people that want to help out, what their capabilities are, and it provides easy access to. So the producer says, all right, well, I want to do this thing over in a remote location. Well, I need somebody who can uh, operate one of the field cameras. Now, beyond that, just getting people to socialize a bit 
and in the classes getting them to uh, work with each other, learn uh, what the others can do. That's where the project-based classes or workshops come in. By going from production, or from pre-production to production, to post-production to distribution, all within a single project, you get, uh, everybody gets their chance to shine. The producer gets their chance to shine at the beginning uh, when you're designing the whole concept. The uh, more technical person gets to shine when you're uh, trying to make sure the camera actually captures proper footage on location or in post-production when you're editing. And then you guys all get to see uh, the uh, views tick up on YouTube or wherever you put this. Uh, and, uh, do you have, uh, let me ask you this, do you have, are the techies in your circumstance not producing or not willing to to um, to generate content for the producers because they think no, their I content's think they, poor? No, I think they Why? are. I think they are. It's just um, that we just we really seem to uh, struggle in a number of ways. One is connecting them together. The techies tend to be, um, they, they will socialize with the people that are there, which is really great. And then I hear them talk about it again. They got all enthusiastic, but then it's the producer who ends up sort of peering out. And part of it is it's time consuming to do these things. And they come in and they don't realize how much time it takes. And then they all sort of peter out. So the ones the techies who don't peter out are usually the youngest folks and the ones who have an alternative that they really want to get into the business. And so then they leave, right? <laughs> so I would I sort of reiterate keeping those projects very short. For investment, because I think they, people certainly have ideas that are larger than be, than they realize. Yeah. You know? <laughs> As I always say, let's let's talk about like what we can actually do. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so and people think they're going to create feature films in a couple of weeks. And that's, well, do you yeah. have the studio face place, place or is it primarily? Studio. Yes. Because I find yeah, I host a show and a producer. If we go live to tape and there's no yeah. post production right, whatsoever, that's, what that's the Okay, so, so model the yes, and we do a lot, and that's so. what we do. But yeah. the problem is that the editing is it, there's so. exactly, and that's exactly why we don't get rid of the studio. I mean, I right. always tell them don't get rid of the studio. The studio is the easiest way for content producers oh, yeah. who don't want to go out there, and and we do all that. It's all done live to tape, but um, there are only a handful that that. Um, learn, have enough confidence to run the studio by themselves, and um, do a hot studio. So then they have to. Then the producer has to look for crew, and it's just we we, we need to fix it. And so I'm well, here thinking. Do, do you have a, you know, things, I'm sorry. Do you have a hot studio? Do you know what a hot studio is? We don't have a hot okay. studio. We've talked about um, getting, you know, having one, and. Um, We've tried to kind of make our studio a hot studio by making it as simple as possible. But you know what? It just isn't. There's just things, you know, a lot of it, like uh, this one guy in particular that I've really trained and I'm feeling a lot of confidence, I will just be there and I won't say a word. Make sure, see if he can pull the whole thing off on. You know, and then he'll make, you know, he'll get lost. Something will happen and he won't know how to solve it. And it's a matter of a button here. But the problem solving just comes with a lot of experience, right? And so then they get caught, and then the minute they get caught, they get scared, so. Um, did you tell them that this is not going to be an easy task, that you have to stick it through before, you, before anything begins? You did? So you should lie to them and tell them it's going to be super easy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because, I mean, because Try that approach, that might work. Because, you know, we, you know, sometimes, you know, like, you're right, you do get producers that go in and they think they're going to be turning out the next Oprah until they figure out how much work is involved. Yeah, I mean, so I don't think it's that much actually. Yeah, I mean, it's really about getting the content out there. Yeah. And so we don't like you have our own in-house show and that's what we use to train the techie folks and um, we actually had a slightly opposite problem um, when our franchise renegotiation happened, happened uh, one of the things that got built into it because the cable company wanted to kill us <laughs> was we, we were required to use their studio we had, at that point had a pretty large pool of technical um, operators 
But when they saw the equipment they were being asked to use, they didn't want to use that. So we lost a lot of the technical Because it was too old or too new? It was. It just wasn't quality equipment. Oh, okay. uh, and, and we're, I'm in Pasadena. So uh, PCC puts out you know, high-end people, you're distance from Hollywood. People yeah. want to be able to touch the real clothes. Of course. So if you ask them to go in and turn one knob on a short mixer and they just got through learning how to use a 32-channel mixer, they're right. not interested in it. That's right. Yeah. Um, so we ended up having very producer-centric, and then we didn't have enough operators. So we were burning out the operators that stuck around. Yeah. And the producers were then being asked to learn how to operate a technical. Yeah. And then it kind of swung the other way, where the producers were burning out because they didn't want to do all this operating. And, we're, and it, we um, tried to realign where we separated the tracks of our training back to a producer track, operator track. Yeah. But uh, I guess just using the model that PCC, Pasadena City College has, you have a producer track and you have an operator track, and at some point you force those two to meet. So that yeah. when you're taking a producer training class, when you actually produce your show, they're using the operator training class to produce that show. So I think if there's a way where you can have the people on one day, instead of saying you want to produce a show, take this class, learn how to do it, actually produce a show and have the operators operate for the show that they're producing. I don't know how long term you can do this and how well it would work. It's easier if they're paying for it because they want to stick around and they want to get the exactly. credits. But it, maybe there is a way where once they start talking to each other, because it really it does come down to producers being able to articulate exactly what it is they want, and then operators getting out of that tech brain and actually hearing what the producer is asking for and being able to deliver that. So if, if there's a way where maybe two or three sessions, the technical operators are working either on a mock production or in, in like the live wire program is an actual production, they have something tangible at the end of the day where this producer, I created this segment for this show, and this operator operated this piece of equipment for this thing, they can see maybe there can be a bridge. But like when you said, you don't get that access to the producers, I think that may be part of it, is we they have, have to understand. Because well, yeah. they you don't have enough anything. Yeah, anymore. because they, yeah, so uh, going along with that, uh, creating the online content that can be uh, accessed by either producers or the uh, technical people, you can actually create that additional learning style needed for either side. So when you do your classes, you can focus on uh, just the use and the more theoretical stuff in either the producer line or the uh, engineering tracks, as you're talking about, can be done with uh, a bunch of online stuff. We had two questions over here. Uh, well, I was just going to uh, kind of like develop on that, you know, what you said, which is, I, I can completely relate to you know, that difference between, that, that's the same thing that we have at our station, that we have people have people that are really, you know, they're out there with the community. They're, they, what they want is to uh, spread the word of what they do to the community, and they're really passionate about what they do. They're social activists at heart. They don't want to necessarily learn, you know, about uh, exposure or f stops or uh, final cut or whatever. And then you have the other, you know, it's a, I don't, I, I couldn't imagine that like, two more disparate, you know, kind of. Because it, I mean, with, and I have, a, I have a degree. Yeah, yeah, I have a degree in computer science, science, and that's my experience. That when I was going to, uh, 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 to college for my degree, techies, they talk a different language, and they don't want to communicate with people that, that are into social, you know, tree huggers and hippies. That's how we'll they do. Next. And that's the truth. But I, I think that giving importance to what we do, which is give access to the community, exactly. to the channels, and to the Given that social importance and, and given it a, a kind of like a, a, a solid concrete, just like you give concrete examples of finalized products of what you can do with Final, Final Cut X or with a D, uh, DSLR camera or whatever, you can also like relate their their cause, their social cause. Let's say, I don't know, look, the project that you did helped, I don't know, 15 kids at uh, Martin King, King Elementary School to you know, get laptops or something like that at the end of the project. So that way you can marry those two, you know, give the techie the social kind of sense to what they're doing and help the social activists acquire the technical tools, uh, you know, and, and be comfortable with that. That's, that, that's the challenge. I don't, know, I don't think it's a solution, but, you know, then yeah. find the challenge to the thing, I don't know. All right. Okay, so you're ready for the solution now? <coughs> We've identified the problem. This is the age-old problem of community media centers. Do you have a uh, college near you? Yes. Where, what is it? University of California, Davis. 
Oh, you're at Davis? Oh, forget about it, girlfriend. Situation <laughs> solved. <coughs> anyway, okay. Uh, yeah, it's the age-old problem. And real quick, two quick things we can talk about. But, but uh, so in Pacifica, you know, we're the oldest community TV station <coughs> out there going in the world. Uh, so uh, we've been dealing with this for a long time. So two things that I think help dramatically. One is, do you have a robust internship program? When I say robust, how many how many interns do you have at your station? Technical <laughs> interns. Well, okay. How many TV production interns do you have at your station right now? Okay, that's that's part one of the solution. Part okay. two. We of the have solution. lots of interns. They come from. Um, we have a whole high school intern program because we do all okay. we run the the. The school channel as well. So they those are indentured servants. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have all the kids who come in after they've graduated from. They're going to work on your shows. Can we be interns? Yeah, and, and they're so going to work. They, they're they going to work for you. Go, you. And know. if you have a robust program that is kind of curriculum based, but at the same time puts them in, the whiffum for that intern is that <coughs> they're going to get that real world experience that they didn't get in three semesters of school, and you're going to have a trade. So if so, that's one part of it. We could talk about that offline. I'm just saying, if you have a really well-developed internship program, that's going to solve part of the problem that you're having with the techies and the techies not wanting to do things and so forth. It's one piece of the puzzle. Uh, and then, just second thing, I'll mention really quickly because I mean, yeah, we got like three minutes left. So yeah, but I've been waiting so long. I know. I've been asking the same question. I got the solution for you. Anyway, real quick, uh, the second part of it is um, you got to put your producers through a funnel. And what I mean by that is, is you got to say, look, if what you want to do is produce programming here on a regular basis, these are the steps that it's going to take. Bing, bang, boom, bing, bang. And then at each step along the way, through their education funnel, whatever you want to call it, process, they get certain rewards. We have, I, I serve, I serve uh, 8,000 subscribers. We have 15 regular weekly in-studio shows. So you're in Davis. 15. Yeah, you heard me right. And the reason why is it because there's something in the water, although I like to think so. The reason why is because we put those producers through a series of checks that, that they realize at every step along the way there's something in it for them and there's something they got to give. There's something they got to do if they want to get to the holy land, which is I have a show. And if they're not willing to go through that from the outset and it's clear and it's defined, then it's a non starter from the gate. And you separate the serious from the curious. But we can talk about it. Anyway. All right. Uh, well, this has been an era of new teaching models. <laughs> we have approximately 30 seconds left or something about that. Uh, if you guys have any last questions, uh, or if you guys want exchange business cards, it's a great chance. We're all pretty much experts here, uh, but it's great to exchange information. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, now is the time. Otherwise, yes. I just have one quick comment. Uh, we have Yahoo group that sends out email. The producers put their crew requests on the Yahoo group. It goes out to all the crew. And that's how a lot of producers get, especially last minute things. They're really eager people. Well, do it. we have that as well. And so that's how they'll get them. Yeah. But they shoot stuff and then they don't. So it's not the shooting of it that's yeah. the problem. It's the completing of it that's the problem. So yeah, it's real hard to get free editors. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming.